With Kroger brand products from Bakers, you can make all your favorite things this holiday season. Because Kroger brand's proven quality products come at exceptionally low prices. And with a money-back quality guarantee, every dish is sure to be a favorite. These are a few of my favorite things. Whether you shop delivery, pickup, or in-store, Kroger brand has all your favorite things. Bakers, fresh for everyone. Hi, it's Andrew here, and as you know, Fred and I are taking a little break at the moment while Fred swans around the Arctic. Uh, we'll be back with the first episode of Space Nuts for 2020 uh, very soon. In the meantime, though, we thought you might like to take a listen to this episode of the new Dark Skies Conversations podcast coming soon. Uh, it features an interview with Fred. It's a great little background uh, as to who he is and what he does. I know you've been listening to him for a few years, but people ask a lot of questions of Fred and his background. So just what does an astronomer at large do? You'll find out in this interview. And of course, you can subscribe to Dark Skies Conversations wherever you get your podcasts from. So sit back, relax and enjoy an interview with Fred. Uh, on our Space Nuts platform and keep an eye out for the Dark Skies Conversations podcast. And I'll chat to you again real soon on Space Nuts. Hi, with a flick of a switch, we turn night to day and day to night. We can change seasons, actions and states of mind. Light is everywhere. Used endlessly and very much a part of our modern world. But what is it? How do we use it? And how is it changing our environment and our behaviours? A starfield sky used to be our evening's entertainment. Now it's Netflix, iPads or even a podcast. When was the last time you looked at the night sky? I'm Marnie Og and this is Dark Sky Conversations, the podcast that brings people and science together to shed light. With me today is Australia's astronomer at large, Professor Fred Watson, an astronomer, a science communicator working with the Department of Industry, Innovation and Science. Prior to this outlandish role, Fred was the astronomer in charge of the Anglo-Australian Telescope at Siding Spring Observatory, Australia's largest optical telescope. Fred is known for his award-winning books, Stargazer, The Life and Times of the Telescope, Why is Uranus Upside Down and Star Craving Mad. He's also had 19 years of interviews on the ABC radio, TV and public appearances and is now heading up some tours around the world with Fred Watson Tours. He's most recently well known for his podcast series Space Nuts. Fred is well loved by the amateur astronomical community, but few know of his pioneering work on multi-object spectroscopy or his fascination for optics and binoculars. His all-around knowledge of all things light place him well as my first guest on Dark Sky Conversations. Thanks for joining us, Fred. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. <laughs> so the question has to be asked, what does an astronomer at large actually do? <laughs> Hopes nobody will find out. <laughs> <laughs> no, so the job uh, is essentially uh, an outreach, uh, education and advocacy role. It's all about trying to spread um, the, the word that science is good for people uh, to let the wider public know just what an enormous contribution Australia makes to the world of astronomy and uh, to engage with uh, with the the wider community internationally. So mm -hmm. uh, there is now a lot of international involvement in astronomy. With things like the Space Agency and... The Space I Agency, imagine. the fact that we are, uh, Australia now has a strategic partnership with the European Southern Observatory, which operates the biggest telescopes in the world mm. on the finest observatory site in the world in northern Chile. Right. And, and so why is, it, is, is astronomy moving offshore to Chile, for example? Um, it, it, it's a really interesting story and depends on how long you've got, but the story goes back to the 1960s when astronomers realised that because of the advent of wide-bodied jets and cheap air, air flight, relatively cheap air flight, mm. uh, they could put their telescopes where the conditions were best rather than where the astronomers happened to be. Before that, astronomy, uh, observatories were always in cities because that's where mm. astronomers lived. Mm. So um, there was a worldwide push to find the very best observing sites mm -hmm. in the world uh, in, during the 1960s. Mm -hmm. uh, and that means uh, sites that are dark without light pollution. That's, of course, a, 
a, a given yes. to start with, which mm. we might talk a bit more about, I guess. <laughs> uh, but also uh, sites which have clear weather and um, in particular sites which have very stable atmospheres, mm -hmm. a, 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 a low level of atmospheric turbulence. And so sites were identified all over the world. Mm -hmm. Here in Australia, Siding Spring Mountain was discovered to be uh, probably one of the best places to do astronomy uh, or visible light astronomy in Australia. Uh, but uh, we now know that some of the other sites in the world are even better. And in particular, it turns out that you need a place uh, on a mountaintop, maybe 3,500 metres, that's kind of 12, 13,000 feet, mm -hmm. on the western seaboard of a continent. That's what you need to get this uh, spectacular atmospheric uh, stability. And the uh, the problem is we don't have that in Australia. We we don't have a mountain uh, mm -hmm. that high on the western seaboard. I mean, we should perhaps pay somebody to build one if we could, but we can't do that. And so... Uh, observatories elsewhere have better sites and that's what's happened the astronomical infrastructure has concentrated on those sites principally in the southern hemisphere in northern chile in the northern hemisphere it's principally the big island of hawaii which has the best conditions in the world mm -hmm. so that's why we engage with uh, with international, international facilities yeah. so you mentioned there a couple of times light the first being um that light is we moved away from light pollution. So what does that mean to an astronomer? What is light pollution and why did you have to move away from it? So many people don't realise that the night sky itself has its own luminosity, mm -hmm. uh, which comes partly from uh, atoms in the upper atmosphere of the Earth relaxing after a hard day in the sun. They get excited and they release that radiation after dark. Uh, there's also dust in the solar system which lights up the night sky and a, a very faint background of stars and galaxies. They all contribute to a natural sky brightness. So astronomers are always battling against mm. that. And often what they're doing is studying faint objects whose light is only maybe 1% brighter than this wow. natural mm. background. Mm. So they're right down there uh, up against what nature throws at you. If you then put in artificial light, you lose the signal altogether. It's mm. as simple as that. So you simply cannot tolerate any artificial light pollution for uh, this kind of groundbreaking research. And so there, are there technologies or anything that we can use to try and adapt the, these conditions? Or is it just simply that we have to have no light pollution? Uh, yeah. Yes, uh, the, Both. <laughs> it, it really yeah. is. Mm -hmm. it, it really is that you you can't have light pollution. Mm. The problem the problem is, um, astronomers look across what we call the whole visible wave band. So their uh, mm. their measurements are made in all colours of light from deep violet uh, and beyond in what we call the ultraviolet, right up the wavelength scale to red light and far and infrared light and far infrared light. Those are that's what you might say covers the the, the visible light wave band. Mm -hmm. And um light pollution tends to occupy much of that uh, spectrum. For a while there was an enthusiasm among astronomers for what are called low pressure sodium vapor lamps. Mm. Uh, because, street lights. Yeah, for street, mm. particularly for mm. street lighting, because they emit light effectively of one single wavelength. It's orange light. It's mm -hmm. very familiar to people. Yes. And so you could eradicate that? Yeah. Okay. You, so mm. what that's doing is only polluting that one little bit of the spectrum. And mm -hmm. the rest of the spectrum is much, much clearer. But you never get a, a, a city or a community that only has... <laughs> So, so everyone's outdoor lights. housing lights, yeah, etc. Yeah. Et Normal to, incandescent yeah. lights, mm -hmm. mercury lights, mm -hmm. all the rest of it. Actually, it turns out now, uh, from the vantage point of 2019, that um, sodium vapor street lights are almost obsolete, mm. and that's for a number of reasons uh, operationally for, for for councils and and bodies like that that actually operate them. These sodium vapor lights have some disadvantages. Right. Yeah. So I've heard you talk previously about uh, a rainbow of light that you that you can study, and you've just mentioned then the band of light. Could you explain a little bit about the barcode of information that you get from 
from from this rainbow, this spectrum of colour that yeah. you know, that astronomers use. Hmm. So yeah, that, I mean it, it's hmm. a really fascinating story. It goes back to Newton, hmm. uh, who uh, played around with a prism in the 1660s and discovered that you can shine white light, for example, sunlight, which is effectively white, even though it looks a bit yellowish to mm. us. Uh, he could pass that light through a prism and break it up into this rainbow of colours, mm -hmm. red, orange, yellow, green, blue and violet. Indigo isn't there. People used to say there was indigo in it as well, but it's not really there. Uh, so the, the six spectrum colours, um, which merge into one another. So it's actually a continuum. And it was Newton who coined the, the term spectrum, in fact. Okay. Back... Uh, a little bit later than that, in the early 1800s, uh, around 1802, uh, a scientist by the name of Wollaston noticed that if he put sunlight through a prism and did it in a way that allowed you to look at specific wavelengths, sorry, look at specific colours, I shouldn't use that term because that came later, uh, Wollaston noticed that there were dark lines crossing the spectrum of the sun and he he sort of thought oh this must be just that where these colors all join together mm. but uh, later in the 19th century it was realized that those dark lines actually uh, are the imprints of atoms in the atmosphere of the sun mm -hmm. and the positioning of the lines actually depends on which elements which okay. atomic elements are producing them okay. and so what you've mm. got is this array of lines and in the sun's case it's it's tens of thousands of them mm. um the, the early guys could only see you know a handful but now we recognize there are very many of them and each one is the signature of a particular uh, a particular atom, a particular okay. element. So in a the sun's particular atmosphere. element like hydrogen yep, or yep, exactly. helium. Yep, exactly. The most common mm -hmm. element is hydrogen. But we also mm -hmm. find iron, calcium, mm -hmm. sodium. All of those things are imprinted on the sun's spectrum. So if you use a device to, to form the spectrum, mm -hmm. then you can tell with absolute clarity what the sun is made of. So what is the device that you use? It's called a spectrograph. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, in, in early days, it was called a spectroscope, which is just a, a, a something for looking. That's the word scopus mm -hmm. uh, at a spectrum. A spectroscope okay. lets you look at a, a spectrum. And the early days, when was this started? The, the, the first uh, people who really put spectroscopes together, we're at the turn of the of the um, 19th century. So okay. the likes of Wollaston. Mm. So it's been around and, for a while. Yes, that's mm. right. Mm. Uh, it was actually two German scientists by the name of uh, Kirchhoff und Bunsen, mm -hmm. a pair of them. Uh, they were the guys who really built the first decent spectroscope. And they were the people who worked out what was going on in the atmosphere of the sun. Mm. And it was actually an Englishman by the name of William Huggins, <laughs> later Sir William Huggins, who, who um, tried that technique on the stars and okay. realised mm. that he could tell what the stars were made of. Was, was there a comment that I remember somewhere that someone said that we would never know what all the stars were? It was, yeah. yes, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> that yeah. was a Frenchman by mm. the name of Auguste Comte. Okay. who was a philosopher, yeah. and in 1835 he wrote in a book, no, we can, we'll never know what the stars are made of, we will never know their densities, mm -hmm. their sizes, we just won't know their mm -hmm. temperatures. He, he said, we'll never know these things. And actually, in that same year, um, a demonstration took place in Dublin, in fact, by uh, a man called Charles Wheatstone, mm. doing more or less the same as I was talking about with Wollaston, but he was using um, a, a, a metal... Two pieces of metal with a spark passing between them. And he realised that uh, if he looked at the spectrum of the mm. spark, it told him what metal uh, okay. that the mm. electrodes were made of. And mm. that was, once again, building up to this idea. Kirchhoff and Bunsen were slightly later. They were uh, around the 1860s. Mm -hmm. So Comp got it wrong. We actually know did. a lot of stuff about yeah. the stars. <laughs> yeah. yeah. He did got it completely So right, what other so. information does light give us about the universe? Uh, it, it's hard to uh, mm. overestimate what mm. we can learn about the spectrum uh, of objects coming from the universe. So not only do you get, uh, for example, if you're looking at stars, you not only get its composition, a star's composition, you can also tell whether it's moving towards or away from us mm -hmm. and how fast it's moving. And uh, that's what you did with the radio velocity? That's right. That's something called the radial velocity. Mm -hmm. it's, the, it's the velocity along the line of sight. Uh, and um, so measuring the velocity of a star towards or away from you mm -hmm. is pretty straightforward to do with a spectrograph, although it actually took until the 1890s before another German called 
Carl the Germans Hermann Vo- have this under Vo- hand, don't they? <laughs> Professor Vogel at Potsdam, he yes. was the first guy to measure a radial mm. velocity. Um, so, yes, you can tell the speeds. Also, you can tell whether an object's rotating. Mm-hmm. You can see that from the spectrum. You can even tell whether it has a magnetic field because a magnetic field actually splits up the spectrum lines that mm-hmm. you see. But wait, there's more. There's more, yeah. There's more because <laughs> you can use, and this is technology that we really have only, uh, we've only had for the last 24, 25 years. You can use a spectrograph to see whether a star is moving slightly towards or away from you as it is pulled this way and that by a planet mm-hmm. in orbit around it. You can't see the planet. It's mm-hmm. too far away and too faint. But you can see... So this is the research that has allowed us to find exoplanets? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. What mm-hmm. we call exoplanets or extrasolar planets. Yeah. And how many have we found now? It's well over 3,000. Um, there, yes, there's, there is a different method that's now used to detect them. That, um, what, the, the method's called the Doppler wobble technique, the mm-hmm. one I just mentioned, because... The Doppler effect, another German scientist, this is the effect of the, of the wavelength of the light changing slightly by the towards or away from mm. you motion of a star. Um, but uh, the, what happens is if you've got a planet going around a star, it pulls the star this way and that, and the, the Doppler effect is measurable for the movement of the star itself. It's a matter of only metres per second for an object the size of Jupiter, but mm-hmm. something the size of the Earth, it's centimetres per second. And these are tiny, tiny velocities. Mm. They're, they're, a crawl, they're not even a walking pace. They're very, very slow. And yet you can use light to measure those, mm. those things. And so as you're saying this, I'm realising how critical technology is with this and how, how much information there is that we could get about our universe, but we, we're actually impairing this with... Light, with light, light pollution, pollution. that's mm. right. Um, mm. Yes, that's correct. Mm. Uh, having said that, all the world's leading observatories, uh, and you can, it's probably half a dozen of them that will be right at the top of the heap there in terms of the, 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 you know, the excellence of the sites that they're on, <clears throat> they're all pr- uh, pr- um, protected with legislation mm. to uh, prevent there being mm-hmm. undue light pollution. And the legislation simply says that if you've got you know, if you've got um, development nearby within up to, well, in, in the case of the Siding Spring Observatory in Australia, it's up to 100 kilometres uh, with 200 kilometres under certain conditions. Developments within that area have to comply with certain And that's all world observatories, all leading? Pretty well, yeah. yeah. Mm. So they, it varies. Um, the, you know, the major observatories in on the island of La Palma in the Canary Islands, there's great observatory there in the northern hemisphere the hawaiian ones the chilean ones there are protections which are more or less effective depending on you know the local circumstances Mm -hmm. i'd just like to go back a little bit to talk about spectroscopy again and specifically ask you about your role in developing multi-object spectroscopy i thought you'd never ask i know yeah and what that is, Let, yeah. please explain exactly sure. what it does. So yeah. this mm. marvellous technique uh, invented by William Huggins, effectively, the, the, the idea of using a spectroscope or a spectrograph, which records the spectrum. Originally it was photographically, now it's all done electronically, uh, to, to, to work out what's going on in the heavens. That um, became very much the stock in trade of astronomers during the first 70, 80 years of the 20th century, Mm -hmm. in other words, up until the 1980s. -hmm. Um, In fact, it still is, but a big change happened in the early 1980s because in the early days you had to make your observations one star at a time. Uh, It was the only way a telescope and a spectrograph combination could work. Uh, Then in the late 1970s, a man with the absolutely delightful name of Roger Angel (laughs) <laughs> who looked at the heavens Doesn't that because he was an perfectly, astronomer. Yeah. Yeah. But he's not a German. So. No, no, he's not. <laughs> he's actually a Brit, but he, he worked at the University of Arizona. Uh-huh. Uh, he's retired now, still one of, you know, uh, American astronomy, astronomy's very favourite astronomers. Roger Angel thought well outside the box in terms of how you could use technology to, uh, to you know, improve astronomy. And he got mixed up with fibre optics. Now, fibre optics were, until 1970, were 
essentially an entertaining diversion. What you, what they are is strands of glass, very fine strands mm-hmm. of glass. This is what we now use for phones and yes, that's undersea right. cables. Exactly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's actually not quite glass. It's fused silica, which is glassy material. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the, but they're drawn into these fine st- strands, um, seldom more than a tenth of a millimetre in diameter. Uh, With the hair? It's... Uh, uh, yes, that's about twice the width of a hair. Mm-hmm. Uh, very, very fine. And they have the property that, like, put light in at one end and it'll come out of the other. Now, they were known, uh, you know, back in the 1950s. It's like a lava lamp. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, no, lava lamps they're, 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 are they're the different, the, yeah. The hair ones. The, yeah, yeah. Yes, mm. that's right. Sorry, yeah, go on. <laughs> Sorry for my aside there, yeah. They were known back in the 1950s, these fibre optics, but it was only in 1970 that the Corning Glass Works in the United States managed to draw fibres because that's how you make them. You, you start off with a block of glass and then you mm. melt it and pull it out into these fine okay. strands. Mm-hmm. They managed to draw f- fibres with extremely low losses. By that, it means that if you put light in at one end, most of it comes out mm-hmm. the other. There was no disruption. Uh, mm-hmm. Well, it, it's, it's, it's attenuation. Mm-hmm. is the technical term. Okay. It's a reduction in the amount of light. It's absorbed by the fibre. Before that, you put light in at one end and a, a tiny dribble came out of the mm-hmm. other. Mm-hmm. But from 1970, with these what were called low-loss optical fibres, that's when they became a potential for the communications industry. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so uh, Corning and so then it, other... So it, ma- it, 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 it allows sound and light to pass through it. Does it allow any other... No, it allows light to pass through it. Okay. You can put light in at one end and it will come out of the other. If you want to transmit sound through it, Mm -hmm. you've got to turn that sound signal into light. Clever. So that's modulating, Mm. uh, uh, you know, a light source. Mm. You imprint a sound wave on it Mm -hmm. and and that transmits through the Mm fibre, comes out the other end and you decode it and you get the sound out. Amazing. So that's how communications work. Uh, But astronomers, and Roger Angel in particular, he thought, well, these things are brilliant because uh, astronomers are always jealously guarding the amount of light that they receive because it is so faint. Mm. Usually we're talking about single photons, Mm. individual particles Mm. of light. Um, So can we use these newfangled optical fibres? And in fact, his first idea was to have many, many telescopes, smallish telescopes, all coupled together with optical fibres. So you gather the light from all these telescopes and bring it back to a single place and you can add all the light together. On one single object? or on... Yes, on one yeah. single object, that's mm-hmm. right. Mm-hmm. But then he turned the idea on its head and realised that with one big telescope, which is looking at an area of sky, mm-hmm. instead of just taking one star or galaxy from within that field of view, mm. you can actually use these optical fibres to... to line up a fibre on many, many objects simultaneously. So let me get this right. We have a field of sky. We have maybe a planet. With Kroger brand products from Bakers, you can make all your favourite things this holiday season. Because Kroger brand's proven quality products come at exceptionally low prices. And with a money-back quality guarantee, every dish is sure to be a favourite. These are a few of my favourite things. Whether you shop delivery pick up or in store Kroger brand has all your favorite things bakers fresh for everyone or is that too close yeah we don't bother with planets okay. for this we technique just look at, doesn't we're work. looking at far <laughs> off galaxies and far yeah. off stars and we could have 15 or 20 items in the sky and we could be looking at all of them and getting this barcode of information from these stars simultaneously, simultaneously. because you can put a fiber on each one and in fact the first one i built actually had 39 optical fibres, which mm-hmm. by the standards of the day were quite, quite large. And so that means 39 objects? Simultaneously. Mm-hmm. So what, um, what Roger Angel did, he, he got a PhD student by the name of John Hill to work on this, and they built something called Medusa, which Medusa's hair. The hair, hair is yeah. lovely. Yeah. And uh, that had, I think, 25 mm-hmm. fibres. And they tried it out on a telescope in Arizona at the Stewart Observatory, and it worked. It was a technique that worked really well. But then astronomers in Australia got hold of the idea, and uh, in particular uh, an engineer at the Anglo-Australian Telescope by the name of Peter Gray, he worked out that you could engineer this thing in a far more effective way than Medusa. And I worked with Peter. Uh, He was working with the Anglo-Australian Telescope. I worked with a smaller telescope called the United Kingdom Schmidt Telescope, Mm -hmm. um, which has a very wide field of view. And together we produced... um, kind of workable optical fibre systems for these two telescopes, uh, which kind of 
took the lead in the world on this science. Could you tell us the names of these? <laughs> well, Peter, <laughs> Peter built the, um, what's it called, the fibre optic coupler. So I can't remember the name, but it turned into FOCAP. Mm -hmm. That was the acronym. Uh, I built something called the Fibre Linked Array Image Reformatter, which was Flare. Mm -hmm. And then Flare was built in the early 1980s. It was the first multi-fiber uh, spectroscopy system that coupled the telescope to a spectrograph, which was actually stationary in the dome. Now, that sounds a bit weird and esoteric, but what it meant was um, the spectrograph, which is a very delicate piece of equipment, was not riding around on the back of the telescope. Uh, mm -hmm. it, was it was fixed on the mm -hmm. floor and was incredibly stable. And that's, you know, so we were the first to do that. So Flare was the pioneer. Then I built a second version because Flare had certain inadequacies. The second one was the panoramic area coverage with higher efficiency, which was Panache. Mm -hmm. so a flare, flare panache. panache. Yeah. Well, what clearly yeah. came next was Finesse. <laughs> Until and? one of my colleagues said, Finesse stands for fails to interest nearly everyone, save spectrograph engineers. <laughs> so we actually called it Flare 2 Flare instead. Two. But that then yeah. evolved to a robotic system mm -hmm. uh, with this more boring name of 60F, uh, with 150 fibres that was commissioned in 2001. And now we're building uh, an amazing machine called Taipan, uh, which uses things called Starbugs. So each optical fibre... 60F had robot, uh, mm. a single robot to move the fibres around. Mm -hmm. But with Taipan, each fibre, of them, there'll be 300 in the end, has its own micro-robot positioning yeah. them around. Meanwhile, mm. the Anglo-Australian Telescope, back in 1996, built something called 2DF. 2DF stands for two-degree field. That's the amount of sky the thing sees. And 2DF had 400 fibres. But I have to tell you, the AAO, which now stands for Australian Astronomical Optics, it used to be the Australian Astronomical Observatory, AAO is building a system with more than 400 fibres for a telescope in Europe, a European telescope. Australia cuts its way up, doesn't it? It, it really does punch above its weight with regards to its yeah. technology and development. Well, that's yeah. right. That's mm. why Australian astronomers have had such a... An, given that we're a small country, because we have this equipment that... Um, you know, we build it probably more effectively than anywhere else. Uh, somebody said we should call ourselves Fibers R Us because that's what we do. We do optical fibers. Uh, the um, you know, you know the, the, tec the technique is in use around the world, mm. but many of the ones that are used elsewhere are ones that have been built I've by the AAO in Australia. In Australia yeah. Fantastic. So just keeping on the technology theme here, I heard Margaret Atwood, of all people, she's the person that wrote... Um, the Maiden's Tale? Handmaiden. Handmaiden. Handmaidens, that's right. Mm -hmm. And uh, she, the comment was that all technologies have got a good use, a bad use, and a ah. stupid use that we never considered. And I'm just thinking about light, and particularly with astronomy, what would you think the good, the bad, and the stupid <laughs> uses? Uh, oh... <laughs> Well, look, um, for optical astronomers, that's visible light astronomers, and I'm not now talking about radio astronomers or X-ray astronomers because no. mm. these are all different uh, disciplines, although we're all looking at the same things. In a different uh, way. In a different way, yeah. and often those results all piece together. Um, optical astronomers, um, their, their stock in trade is light, so they are obsessed with light, mm. and more especially obsessed with, uh, with actually getting the very best information from light. So the good is what we learn from from the uh, you know from from the sky by sifting light through the spectrographs and other mm. other types of instruments. natural light from the sky. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. The bad is light pollution, of course. <laughs> so that's when light, which has been used for a completely innocent purpose, mm. uh, but gets out of hand, uh, in particular in the light plumes of cities, and and really it goes back to. Uh, the early 20th century when councils put in lights with really no regard to what that was doing to the night sky mm. uh, because we you know, know. simply never thought mm. about it. Mm. Um, it was becoming a problem by the time of the Second World War. It's really interesting. As early that, as that. Yeah, mm. in, in uh, Los Angeles, which is very next, very near the Mount Wilson Observatory, in fact, you can see Los Angeles from Mount Wilson, mm. where at the time the biggest telescope in the world was. During the Second World War, Los Angeles had... Uh, blackouts mm. in order to uh, 
to mitigate the possibility of invasion. And during that time, huge astronomical discoveries were made yeah. uh, because the, the, the night sky could be seen properly from Mount Wilson mm. again. Mm. So it was inadvertent. So that's the mm. bad sign. Just on that, I, I, I've attended some conferences in the UK and one of the issues that they have when they talk about trying to mitigate light pollution in the UK is that if you start talking to people, particularly in that sort of generation, about turning off streetlights and, and, <laughs> and lights, they feel like it's taking them back to the, the war. The war, that's right. Just like the blackout. Yeah. We had to do that in blackout days. Yeah. Yes, I know. I yeah. remember people mm. saying all that. And it, it, that's true. Um, mm. But it's not a blackout. I mean, what we're talking about now is good lighting mm. uh, because... Um, there's been huge progress in the last 20 years with understanding mm. the ills of light pollution. And it's not just for astronomers where the, you know, where the least important in many ways of the, of the consequences of bad lighting. I, again, when I talk to groups about light pollution, I often, well, I haven't often, but I have been asked by people, well, why do we have to keep the lights down for the astronomers when you've got a whole heaven of stars, you know, why can't they just study the star to the left or the brightest star or whatever? And I think in some ways we lost that argument when we talked 30 years ago when, when the International Dark Sky Association started and it was astronomers saying, oh, we're losing our night sky. That, that story was lost on the general public. They didn't understand the information that you're getting about our heavens. And, but and, that's yeah. probably mm, true. They mm. think, um, I mean, most people mm. think an astronomer... Uh, is a middle-aged bald man with a white coat who's got a long spindly telescope and just spends his nights looking through it. Mm, mm. And nothing could be further from the truth. It's all about, you know, well-directed um, scientific problems. We're trying to understand the universe because that understanding might actually turn out to be really useful to us one day. Uh, and it's uh, it's conducted in a, a very, um, you know, a very uh, progressive way. It's not just looking for mm. the sake of looking where we're studying. And, of course, the other great thing is that it's no longer a bald, middle-aged man. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we, it's much we, more diverse. We are yeah. far more diverse mm. than that. Yeah. Mm. So that's the good and the bad. Yeah. What's the what quirky? about the stu stupid, you know, stupid use of technology that maybe has come through astronomy, through light, and and I, I I know of things you talked about the Doppler effect, isn't? Yeah. yeah. So I, yeah. I I actually you know you you could almost um, lump the the fiber optics work that I was talking about into the it's certainly quirky uh, because in you know in 1970 nobody had thought in mm. this direction. It was Roger Angel towards the ed end of the 1970s were thinking outside the box as to what you could use these technologies for. And I do remember when I started working on this in 1982, building Flare, the first fibre optic system for the Schmidt telescope, uh, one of my colleagues called it Watson's Folly because nobody believed that it would do anything useful, mm. that it would just, you know, it was just be quirky. It's like, it, it's a bit like... Um, Back in the post-war period, the, the then director of the Mount Stromlo Observatory, which uh, it w was Australia's national um, observatory at that time, Mount Stromlo in Canberra, the Commonwealth Observatory, uh, Sir Richard Woolley, somebody said to him, so where do you think radio astronomy will be uh, in yeah, 10 years' yeah. time? Mm. And he said, forgotten. And, and I think people thought that about the fibre optics work. Where do you think fibre optics mm. will be in 10 years' mm. time? Forgotten. And it's not. And yet it's, it's, now, it's now going to be used on the it, biggest telescopes. It, it is already being used on the biggest telescopes in the mm. world. It is, is it absolutely revolutionised the science because what it lets you do, as I said, you know, we didn't carry through the conversation that it lets mm, you look sorry. at many objects mm. at a time, 400 on the AAT. Mm. Uh, it'll be 4,000 on, the, on the, the Vista telescope, which is in Chile, operated by the Europeans. Mm. Um, that then allows you to gather enormous data sets of the most intimate statistics of stars and galaxies and quasars, all these objects in the, mm -hmm. in the wider universe. And by doing that, you can, first of all, you can do population census studies. You can look at the trends. You can start discovering a lot about the evolution of the universe. It's how we know, uh, for example, that the, the, the Big Bang uh, model of the origin of the universe, how that is almost certainly the, the, the correct model because we can see its imprint all mm. over, uh, all over the, the millions of galaxies that we now have 
um, three-dimensional positions for, thanks to the fibre optic technique. So it's kind of revolutionised that study, but it also shows up the real oddballs. Mm. So if you're looking at, you know, 4,000 stars at a time, you're going to find things that are very, very unusual. And they're the ones that point the way to things like new physics, the the, the, the understanding that relativity and quantum theory might mm. not be all that there is. These mm. are things that uh, we, you know, they're the best models of reality we've got. But we still... But we still find mm. gaps in them. Mm. And what we're looking for is what might be hidden underneath, which could lead to all kinds of things like teleportation, That's time right. travel yeah. and yeah. all that great stuff. And it actually leads me into the, the other question that I had is a real basic one, but what is the speed of light? <laughs> the speed of light and is... talking about Einstein yeah, and, and right. all that we know from him. So, yeah. uh, mm. yes, that, so, so going mm. back to uh, 1905, when Einstein published his special theory of relativity, which, uh, you know, these are gobbledygook words, but that's a theory of the way objects move. Uh, and it sort of built on what Newton wrote in 1687 in his book Principia, the Principia. Uh, he wrote his laws of motion, which are, which are fine and work well mm. until you get near the speed of light. The speed of light was already well known at that time, 300,000 kilometres per second. How? How was it known? Uh, by, actually, it was first measured by a Danish astronomer in 1687 mm -hmm. by looking at the moons of Jupiter, a man called Römer. He uh, worked, I think, in Copenhagen, uh, studied the moons of Jupiter and realised that the way they behaved, um, as he could see them in the sky, meant that there was a time lag in the travel time of the light from mm -hmm. the backside of Jupiter to the front side of Jupiter. Goodness. And he analysed all that and he mm. got a cracking good answer for the, for the speed of light. <laughs> there was actually French physicists in the late 19th century who really mm. kind of tied it down. But what was curious, and this is what fed into Einstein's thinking, was that everybody expected the speed of light would be something variable. So that uh, if you think about um, the speed of sound here mm. on Earth, uh, the speed of sound is carried through air. And if you're on a moving object like a car, uh, and the speed of sound changes for you mm -hmm. because it's... Uh, it, 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 so if you're stationary and you have a car go past you, you can hear... Well, that's the that Doppler effect, actually. Okay. That's, mm -hmm. a, that's going back to what we were talking mm -hmm. about earlier. But the, 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 everybody expected that, you know, if you, if you were, say, if you were looking at a source of light and that light is reaching you at 300,000 kilometres per second. If you're stationary, yeah, that's fine. But the thinking was, if, in fact, you're moving towards that light mm. at 100,000 kilometres per second, then you should see its speed as being less than or mm -hmm. more than what it actually was. Mm. It turns out that the speed of light is fixed in a vacuum. doesn't matter how you're moving, how the light source is moving, mm -hmm. it is always 300,000 kilometres per second. And one, once, once you realise that, that was actually um, confirmed by two Americans, Mickelson and Morley, in the 1880s, uh, that the speed of light is invariant. And, and Einstein fed that into his work mm -hmm. and realised that actually the speed of light is almost mystical. It's it, because... Space can vary. Space can change its shape mm, mm. depending on your motion. And time can change depending on your motion. But the speed of light doesn't. It's the, it's the thing that's it's immutable. Constant. It's an absolute constant, mm. yeah. There is, uh, there is a, a group, a small group of scientists, one of whom is based here in Australia, a man mm. called John Webb, <laughs> who's nearly always somewhere else in the world, which is why he's called the World Wide Web. Uh, John <laughs> Webb, is um, uh, he believes he has evidence that the speed of light was different in the early universe. Oh. Looking back, 13.5, mm. 13.6 billion years, the beginning of the universe was 13.8 billion years ago, to the best of our knowledge. And, it, and he looks back nearly all that way and thinks he can see evidence that the speed of light has changed. It's a very speculative mm. result, and mm. not many astronomers believe him, but John Webb is convinced of that from the University of New South Wales. Oh. Well, well, we'll keep an interesting yeah. an, an eye on that to see how it progresses. Yep. Yeah. So, Fred, when was the last time you looked at the night sky? <laughs> last night. 
<laughs> did you? Yep. I <laughs> went out and looked at the stars and mm. thought, yeah, there's a bit of cirrus around. It's mm. not a brilliant night. Yeah, look at So I, when was the best time you looked at the, what What's the most memorable experience you've had in the nighttime environment? It's because my life has been in astronomy and it goes back now a long way. Um, there are many, many uh, that I could that I could talk mm. about. Um, one of them was in the uh, mid to early 2000s, 2006, uh, 2007. Uh, late in 2006, a colleague of mine, Robert McNaught, in, mm. at Siding Spring, discovered a comet. That was his, his job. He discovered comets. But this one turned out to be incredibly bright. And uh, in the early months of 2007, it was just dazzling in the western evening mm, sky mm. Uh, and that, where i lived at that time was totally does a free comet from just come pollution. once or do you that particular one uh-huh. does yeah mm. not all of them do some mm. some go around the sun uh, many of them are, are in orbit around the sun but comets actually come from the depths of the solar system in fact almost halfway to the next nearest star there's a sort of shell of these icy objects mm. uh, called the Oort cloud, named after a man called Jan Oort, who was a Dutch astronomer in the mid-20th century. He said there must be a cloud of icy objects out mm. there which fall inwards towards the solar system, and when they get near the sun, the ice evaporates and they become luminous. And, and he was what, right. Yeah, mm. he was right. Mm. And that's how, we, that's how we know about comets. Uh, but uh, So Comet McNaught was one of these that came out of the blue. It, Rob McNaught detected it when it was quite faint, but it turned out to be probably the most spectacular comet of the century mm. so far, mm. Mm. and it may be the most spectacular for the whole century. It was just Might be the most stunning. spectacular one you see. Yeah. 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 So that's one. But I, I always, I've got a very fond memory of a night which would have been in the early 1980s, and it was when I was building the first of these fibre optic systems, the flare mm. thing that I mentioned. That uh, was a device that, as I said, used optical fibres to pick the light of stars from the focus of the telescope. And it brought them, the fibres brought them out of the telescope uh, to a, 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 basically a little thing that just lined them all up in a straight line. Now, mm. this straight line was about half an inch long, 13 millimetres or something like that. Mm. But it had 39 optical fibres in it, each of them um, about a tenth of a millimetre in diameter. And it was a crystal clear night, and I'd got the telescope all set up and thought this was right at the beginning of these experiments. And I picked up this uh, little fibre unit from the floor, which I knew had the light of stars coming down it. Mm. And I looked in the end, and I just saw a line of little lights, little all lights. different colours. Because stars are different colours. Mm. The colour is dependent on the temperature. And it was magical. Um, so you were standing there with Holding light. starlight in my hand, yeah, mm. with, with these, these 39 fibres lit up, mm. shining away. And it was the, the real reason why it was a buzz is because it's actually quite hard to get light down fibres. It has <laughs> to be done very, very precisely. Uh, and at that point, I knew I could do it. Mm. And I knew the instrument was going to work. Mm. And it did. Amazing. <laughs> Amazing. So just to finish up, I'd like to ask you, if you had your soapbox <laughs> and three minutes of time, yes. what do you want people to know about light and light pollution? Okay, so this is where I become, uh, well, an advocate. Mm. Um, it's not quite activi- activism. It's very gentle activism. What, <laughs> what do, do we, we want? want? <laughs> what do we want? Moderate change. When do we want it? In due course. Yes. So that's my soapbox. Yeah. Um, and what I would tell people is that um is ask them to think about where their light is going light basically goes on forever uh i mean it 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 does dwindle away to to very faint levels but if you're sending a beam of light upwards into the sky uh what's it going to do it's going to light up the molecules of the atmosphere and spoil that view of the sky for somebody else and it's a death by a thousand cuts Mm. so uh, individually, our contribution to light pollution is very low. But collectively, when you've got a city like Sydney with mm. more than 4 million people living there, nobody thinks about where the light is going, then you've got a, a city in which it is impossible to see the stars. Mm. Um, uh, so it's just to to think about lighting up only what you want to light up, keep the light below the horizontal plane so none of it's going upwards into the sky, 
Um, and the, 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 there's a, a subtlety here. We now know that uh, light that is rich in blue, and that's really that dazzling white light that mm. we're getting used to bright, from bright white light, light, mm. light emission di- diodes, mm. light emitting diodes, LEDs. LEDs. Mm. Um, that light we now know is not good for human health uh, at night because it uh, it fools our circadian rhythms into thinking it's still daylight mm. and that screws up everything. So think about light. That's the answer. Thanks for your time. Brooke. It's a great pleasure. Anytime. <laughs> Thank you. Well, that's it for Dark Sky Conversations this week. We hope you enjoyed it. We'd love to hear your feedback, thoughts, or if you've got any questions about light pollution. So send us an email podcast at darkskytraveller.com.au or Instagram us at darkskyoz. Please subscribe to our podcast at iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts from. And while you're there, give us a review. Thanks again. That's it for me this week. Until next week, lights out. With Kroger brand products from Bakers, you can make all your favorite things this holiday season. Because Kroger brand's proven quality products come at exceptionally low prices. And with a money-back quality guarantee, every dish is sure to be a favorite. These are a few of my favorite things. Whether you shop delivery, pickup, or in-store, Kroger brand has all your favorite things. Bakers, fresh for everyone. 